happening now. We'd like to welcome our viewers from across North America and around the world. This is the EdTech Situation Room for Wednesday, August the 29th, 2018, episode 105. And this is Wes Fryer coming to you from Oklahoma City, where I got home about 15 minutes ago. And so, yes, you get the tie. So I remember when Miguel Gulen was a guest, he felt, you know, very intimidated, like I was trying to upstage him. So I will assure Jason, that I am not trying to get into a how fancy can we dress contest because I'm sure that I would lose. But joining me as always is the ever um, appropriately dressed with map in the background, <laughs> Dr. Neifer. How are you tonight in Missoula? Is it lovely and cool up there in the in the Great White North? Uh, it's pretty nice, actually. I we we had a, some deliciously cold weather on Monday. In fact, it got down to 41 degrees overnight and only got up to 59 on Monday, which is pretty great August weather for Western Montana. Um, and I am Jason Neifer. I am the assistant director and curriculum director of the Montana Digital Academy, and uh, located on the University of Montana campus and fabulous Missoula, Montana. And the one thing I may have on US, although you could surprise me here. Um, I can tie a real bow tie. So I've taught myself that skill and um, I, I love wearing a bow tie. Everything becomes about the bow tie when you wear the bow tie, unfortunately, but I, I do like it. And part of the reason why I like to do the tie up one is because you can kind of undo it at the end of the day and it kind of hangs down kind of like your Tony Bennett. So, uh, you know, like <laughs> do what you got to do. So for those of you that have not joined the podcast at this particular point in time, and by the way, where have you been? Uh, this is the EdTech Situation Room. We are a podcast that takes a look at technology news, and we tend to discuss it through an educational lens. And Wes, tech director, Jason, uh, e-learning administrator, we have a lot of experience working with teachers across the United States and with students inside of classrooms. We like to talk tech and see a little bit what's going on in the world. So, Wes, I know that I'm sure there are things that, that are probably piquing your interest tonight. Is there a particular place you'd like to start? Well, I will first let you know that someone in Oklahoma submitted a couple proposals for NCCE 2019 last night. So, you know, who knows? Um, we, we need to, we need a rendezvous. So yeah. I, su I submitted a, an Ignite and a, and a uh, digital citizenship session. So we will see. Um, I like your, your category. So Jason uh, did a lot of great link adding here. And so we've got the circus updates. I added Apple rumor mill. We got the Chromebook, Google world, social media, net neutrality, access, can of worms topics and the geeks of the week. So Alex, I think I will take can of worms topics for uh, $100. And okay. Uh, that's interesting that you picked the can of worm topics because every one of these is kind of a can of worms, but I want to start with the one that I threw in there, which, uh, you know, could go a little haywire if we're not careful, but um, uh, Time Magazine on August 20th, 2018 reported that the UK, which has always been extremely proactive about trying to protect uh, kids online from unsavory things, and it will define for the purposes of this discussion unsavory things as pornography. Um, but they are working on a final um, uh, scheme to force any adult content that's deemed to be pornography to force you to prove your age. And uh, the article actually, and I, I tried to look this up a little bit, and I wasn't really clear about what the schemes look like for this, and maybe that's the crux of the controversy. But it, 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 it piqued my interest for a number of reasons. The first one was that, uh, that free speech advocates in the UK are freaking out about this. And part of it is because obviously there's the hazy line between what constitutes adult material and what doesn't. There's also a, a sense of uh, if you ban it for minors, that has a chance of, of expanding from that, expanding to other categories that somewhat arbitrary might get in the way of free speech. And free speech is, is a more protected right in the United States than it is in, in the UK. For those of you that have not taken a comparative government class lately, it's not unprotected in the UK, but the United States has much clearer protections for free speech than, it, than um, our friends across the pond. The reason why this piqued my interest is not because I particularly wanted to debate 
the merits of, of, of pornography access for kids, but rather I think it does spark up interesting conversations as it relates to where we censor uh, information for students and that's related to filtering. And I don't think that that uh, Wes and I together, like like what talking with one another in person, have gone off on epic rants about filtering, uh, because and and at one point the the uh, advocacy that Dr. Fryer was pushing was balance filtering that. Uh, there is no doubt a need for filtering, and I do think that there are categories of websites, and I would include adult material in schools, that we should make a reasonable effort to try to block. But what has happened in the last five or six years, although to be quite frank, I don't hear as much about this than I used to. It seemed to be a bigger topic four or five years ago. Uh, but you have to make decisions in your school about what you're going to allow and what you're not going to allow, and understanding that the internet doesn't work in a way that you can magically erase all of the things that may be considered unsavory for the population you're trying to protect. So the reason why I wanted to, to, to bring this topic up tonight, Wes, is that you being a tech director, tell me a little bit about what it's like to run a filter um, in a school that you serve as tech leadership. Well, we are relatively open uh, compared to the majority of public schools that I have been uh, part of as a teacher and as a parent and as a visiting professional development presenter, you know, because you learn that you need to, in many cases, provide a whitelist of websites if you yes. want folks to be going to them and using them. Um, you know, and I've been to schools that blocked all third party email, Yahoo Mail, Gmail. You know, I've been in a district that blocked Google at one point. I mean, that was crazy, but yes, it happened. So, <clears throat> We, we had a sonic wall filter when I came to be the tech director a little over three years ago. And about a year or so ago, we moved over to smooth wall. I don't think our filtering policies have changed that much. Um, we have concerns over bandwidth, actually a little bit more than, you know, even access. Um, we use a Cisco Meraki system. And so what I've ended up, what we've ended up doing for social media sites like Snapchat and Instagram is, uh, is basically giving a quota to individuals so that uh, we actually have Snapchat filters. And I'm really glad we do this in terms of encouraging students to appropriately, you know, share and amplify their learning and what they're doing at right. school and, you know, sports and social media, Twitter accounts and, and that kind of thing are, are pretty big, but, um, you know, uh, on our filter, I mean, I, I had one particular student last year, I think, who was who was consuming daily about five gigs on the network with um, Instagram and Snapchat. And so the filtering has been not cutting it off, but, you know, limiting how much because you really don't need to be, put, you know, pulling five gigs of video data through Snapchat, you know, at school. Uh, and then also, um, you know, with Netflix having, you know, teachers log in and having that block and then gaming has actually been our biggest thing. So oh. uh, we've had to um, block most Steam games. And as far as kids were BYOD at the high school. And so during break times and and our kids, we have um, we have seven periods, but and, and we're, we're moving to a block schedule finally, actually next year. But uh, kids have a lot of study halls, and so depending on what they're going to do, I mean, we, we found that we could have some really substantial bandwidth consumption that was coming um, from, from games. And so it's still a challenge, but um, it's, you know, it, it's a little bit less. I mean, I, I haven't actually done as much like making sure all VPN tunnels are blocked and, you know, kids also have their phones, right? So it's uh, the, the reality is, um, you know, the Wi-Fi that we provide, depending upon what time it is and where they are, uh, I think it's better than it, than it certainly, you know, was three years ago. I mean, our, our pipe is, is uh, about 10 times what it was uh, three years ago. In terms of how much, how much down do you have? We have 1.3 gigs now. So, wow. Um, that's good. Um, and that's for a school of 900 kids. Yeah. So, but I mean, you know, at home here, I am getting 300 down, you know, for our family of four. So, right. so you know, when you, when you just put that out amongst everybody. So anyway, I think it's been more about bandwidth management than it really has been about blocking, but right. Um, it's, uh, you know, Conversations about digital citizenship, uh, conversations with teachers about about monitoring, 
And, um, you know, I think we've had more issues with, for instance, anonymous polls on Twitter and some, you know, inappropriate things that have happened right. with that than we really, than I have really encountered a lot with, with email or sorry, with, um, with inappropriate. Um, but um, we're also implementing a, a gaggle, which is a safety filtering solution. And um, this is the first full year of implementation for all of our students. And so it monitors student email accounts as well as their Google Doc, their Google Drive documents. And uh, the main thing is to try to prevent acts of violence. So imminent harm to students, whether that would be suicide or bringing weapons right. to school, anything like that. Um, but then there's also a host of other issues that come in and we work with a school psychologist and our, our principals or our division directors about all that. So right. that ends up being more about filter, about monitoring and, and trying to proactively monitor, you know, than it is just blocking. But there is blocking that's involved um, with that, depending upon um, what, if we're talking about email right. is blocked and then the, the Google Docs are, are uh, you know, we get, we, there are, there's notifications that are set up. So as right. a teacher, did you have experienced some frustrations with uh, filters back in the day? I did. And one of the things that I had to deal with was the fact that I was, I was, I had an off grid laptop. So I, my personal laptop, which um, at some point the tech guy in my building, <coughs> excuse me, gave me an IP address for it. We had a, uh, we had uh, hard-coded IP addresses, and we, we had a side conversation. He agreed finally to, to give me my own IP address for that, for, for my personal laptop. Um, but um, uh, our Wi-Fi blocked YouTube. So before I, I had that IP address, I just had no YouTube access. And, you know, I, I like video clips. I taught history and geography. And, you know, I, I would defy you to say that, that, that it is easy to teach um, uh, uh, without the, the power that YouTube brings to you when you're teaching a, a good dynamic content like geography or history. My favorite video uh, to kind of demonstrate to, to uh, teachers, especially uh, history and social studies teachers, is uh, the there's a number of great videos where they show uh, uh, rush hour in Japan and the squishing of people into subway cars. They have people whose job is to cram people into subway cars so they could fit everyone into it. And so like they, they're dressed like police and they cram people into it. And uh, it, it always led to an amazing discussion. I, I taught freshmen every year of my career, even though by the end I was also teaching AP and different electives and stuff. Um, but I love like exposing students to that two minute piece of media, which then led to a half an hour of discussion. And when I didn't have access to YouTube and I found ways around it, you can download videos videos and such and I had Dropbox and so I would download my videos the night before and stick them in a Dropbox and blah 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 but yeah I did run into it a little bit and then I have to tell you in context of, of my program the, the state virtual school in Montana like I get the bandwidth issues right I think that's a good legitimate filtering concern I do feel like sometimes that the filtering um, is counterproductive. For example, if you're if you're if you're filtering streaming music because you don't want kids to be on streaming music because it takes up bandwidth, I understand that. But here in 2018, if you're not unblocking, um, or, or if you're not if you are not blocking video, then students will just use YouTube then as as a music source, right? That's what, uh, uh, especially before Spotify came along, YouTube kind of was the alternative. Uh, to uh, having you know uh, music collections of your own if you don't want to carry them around, around with them on your phone, so I think that's a these are all critical pieces of this process. But when I work with schools, um, you know, especially related to YouTube, YouTube is the greatest e-learning tool that's ever been created. There's a massive archive of stuff, and I will fully admit that that 80 percent, 90 percent, maybe even 95 percent of YouTube is not super great, but the five percent is great enough. And it's, it's large enough that it really provides the ultimate kind of window on the world. So I'm interested to hear, Wes, do you have any of these discussions in context of the administration of your school? Uh, do you ever have filtering d d discussions there? Or has this been largely left to your purview in your position? No, we definitely, definitely have conversations. And, um, you know, I think, you know, Snapchat wasn't actually unblocked when I when I came and you know, that was part of our communications department that wanted to see students um, have access to that. We don't, we do have differentiated filtering from the standpoint that when students are on, let me think about this. Yes, when they're, when they're on our guest network with their own devices, 
Um, for instance, all game, most gaming stuff is blocked and Netflix is blocked. And then they're subject to those kinds of, of uh, bandwidth filter or, you know, bandwidth quotas. Um, you know, what I, what I want to do and will hopefully implement maybe even in the next year uh, is a differentiated filtering where we've got authentication happening that identifies, you know, what division that they're in or especially just that they're student, you know, versus a, a faculty member in terms of giving faculty, for instance, they don't have to put in a password to be able to get to Netflix or, or those kind right. of things. Um, so, yeah, it's been a conversation. I think from, for this article uh, in Time Magazine, you know, part of, part of the issue here, you know, is this idea of anonymity and if we can be anonymous on the web um, and, you know, are you going to be able to, you know, to what degree are you going to be able to block things that protect children and to what degree are you going to block things that, that block things for everybody? And this isn't a defense um, of objectionable content, but I do think part of the, the basic uh, structure of the internet is it's end to end design and the idea that we don't have right. a lot of gatekeeping in the middle. We pass along packets. I know net neutrality is one of our, our categories tonight. So that kind of fits into that. Um, we certainly need parents and schools to be providing filtering, right? I talked to a mom a week ago Sunday <clears throat> who's divorced and both of her, you know, elementary age kids, dad has bought them iPhone eights and he's the techie guy. And so she's concerned because, you know, her third and fourth grade kids, you know, have these phones that don't have any kind of filtering, any kind of parental controls, right. you know, and uh, um, I don't think, trying to think of, oh, it's uh, somebody that we've interviewed at school for a job. He talked about that as kind of a loaded weapon, you know. Um, yeah. Those of us that have gone hunting, you know, you, you, can ha you can teach children how to shoot guns and how to do that safely. Now, granted, that's not an unsupervised use of guns, but, you know, there's a lot of instruction and a lot of really deliberate, in, uh, you know, coaching that goes in there to make sure that that is a safe experience. And so, you know, people aren't being, you know, maimed and, and killed by their smartphone. But I think an argument could be made that there are kids being scarred and damaged. We had a friend just this last week whose child was shown something really absolutely horrific on the school bus by another child who, you know, had their phone and showed them this video. So I think that, that this prospect of the UK, you know, trying to to filter, you know, will be fraught with, with, uh, with issues. There's going to be ways for kids to get around it. This is the thing that always happens, but I think, I do think we have an obligation as, as adults to try and protect children from, um, the dark, dark sides of the world, which unfortunately do exist. Um, on the other hand, we also need to prepare them to make independent choices and hopefully responsible choices when they have less restrictions and freedom, i.e. they leave the house, they go to college, they go into the world of work. You know, if the first opportunity a kid has had to have any kind of web freedom is, you know, at 18 when they're, when they're leaving the house, right. you know, it may not go very well. And there's, we've talked about, you know, addiction with social media and things like that. Um, there's plenty of, of problems with folks getting into the darker sides of the web and having serious issues there. So, you know, England's going to go down this road and, and we'll kind of see what happens. But I think the United States historically with the Internet has had the right approach, which is that ISPs are not supposed to do that, you know, right. and it, it can be up to the individual user who decides that they're going to put parental controls on our phones or we're going to put some kind of filtering. And I definitely think just like, you know, schools under E-rate, uh, and I think any any responsible school today, whether they're getting money from the E-rate program or not, is going to be having at least basic levels of filtering that is going to be making sure certain kinds of content are not accessed at school. But ultimately, there's going to be lots of choices that are involved, especially with students having their cell phones. And hey, you know, in a couple of years, it's going to be 5G and kids are going to be able to download two and three gigabyte movies, they say, in four to five seconds. So, you know, it's going to make our 1.3 gigs of of campus bandwidth, you know, seem quite paltry, uh, right. evidently, you know, so they say. Right. Well, and just to note, this was a can of worms topic. So look at us opening up that can of worms and talking through those issues. So are you the two other articles, something you want to mention tonight, Wes? Sure. I'll also give a shout out to, to Peggy, who's, you know, asking if parents know how to filter content for their for their kids. I mean, that's, that's a great question. That's the digital citizenship conversation. So yep. it's, there's multiple ways to do that. And I think that's part of, you know, the conversations we need to be having with our parents, no matter what school 
where we right. happen to be is, is empowering them. Um, yeah, this is an incredible article. So this is from Forbes on August 15th. Shout out to, um, I think it's this week in Google, um, the latest episode where Leo Laporte talked about this. To catch a robber, the FBI attempted an unprecedented grab for Google location data. So we're learning about this after uh, basically an embargo on the release of this. This happened back in March. And I'll just read the first paragraph. Back in March, <clears throat> as it investigated a spate of armed robberies across Portland, Maine, the FBI made an astonishing unprecedented request of Google. The feds wanted the search giant to find all the users of its services who'd been within the vicinity of at least two of nine of those robberies. They limited the search to within 30 minute time frames around when the crimes were committed, but the request covered a total space of 45 hectares and could have included anyone with an Android or iPhone using Google's tools, not just the suspect. So let's comment that I think last week or the week before we've had this controversy over privacy and how even if you are, you know, turning off your share by location, that Google with, with Google Maps, um, and then I think it's also an Android, is actually still recording data and passing things to the cloud about where you are. Let's also note that your service provider, your cell phone provider, they know where you are. You connect to cell towers, cell towers have locations, you have an IP address, and so they know general vicinity. And so I think <laughs> this, is, this would be a great conversation starter for kids because, you know, we are ceding a tremendous amount of our privacy to those folks who are making the connections for us. The, the data provider for your cell phone, the internet company that you're using, but especially the cell phone you know, data provider, and then also the apps that we trust. And so we certainly want law enforcement to be able to catch people, but this kind of draconian, you know, let, let me let me come up with my own little out if this then that algorithm of, you know, I'm thinking of Venn diagrams. It's it seems pretty genius, and you would, um, I don't know, perhaps suspect in China or in some other countries that you know, and maybe those aren't even going to become public. It's great in the United States that these things do you know get released and we can talk about them. But this is pretty eye opening, and you know. What are your thoughts? It's it just it seems to me like such a wow in terms of law enforcement. And maybe this is a is, is Harbinger, Harbinger, what's Harbinger? What's how do you say that word? Is this of something that's to come? We're just we're because they this was denied. Google fought it and it wasn't denied. But you know, law enforcement may continue to try. Or I don't know, is this no right. big deal, Jason? And just yeah, man, privacy is such an old concept. Just right. you know, get used to it. Welcome to the surveillance state. Well, and the thing for me that I think is interesting about that is that I uh, I haven't done it in a year or so, but I used to have a conference and training session that was about understanding the uh, understanding the data collected on you in 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 in, in the modern day. And the one of the, the approaches I did to that was that I uh, Google and Facebook are the easiest to show the data that they're collecting on you. I'm sorry, Google and Facebook are easy to look at that topic because they actually will show you the data they collect on you, right? Where you can go into Google and see all your past location data and you can actually delete that data too, although I don't know if that deletes it from a central database or not. But I think the important piece there is that I've advertised that in the past is that I trust Google. I believe that Google has a business model that that has to have trust otherwise it, it it ceases to exist right like if google becomes a you know an easily hackable entity where my private data and let's say just my location data for a moment is available uh easily to an outsider or to a third party that's problematic for me but it it's um it's interesting that law enforcement are trying this as a strategy right because one of the trusts i have is that Google trusts me to look at my own data that it collects on me. It allows me to turn things on and off. I then find that to be very empowering as an end user, right? But if there's a chance or if it becomes a, a legally viable strategy for uh, law enforcement to access that data on my behalf, then I have to re-question my participation in that process, even though I do believe my data is used for generally good at Google. Uh, something fascinating that was mentioned in that uh, this week in Google, which by the way is the Twig podcast, and Leo Laporte deleted his Twitter account this week. Can you? I can't believe he did that. Oh wow! Great. Well, yeah, that is interesting. Uh, 
But uh, one of them said, okay, so do we have some apps where I can put false information into the system to say I'm in different places, you know, or um, I don't know. I, I think that trusting Google, I'm still, I'm, I'm on that page. But once your data has been put in the cloud, you're also trusting that it won't be hacked, that someone right. won't get it. And if law enforcement acquires it, we're also trusting that law enforcement is not going to be hacked. And that data doesn't, you know, come. So there's a lot of, there's, I think there's some viable hand wringing to do about this. And this, if I don't know if I'm pronouncing the harbinger word correctly, but this does just seem like a harbinger of the new, the new order, you know, the new surveillance state, because if you use a cell phone, you know, you can choose the apps that you use and the permissions, but there's still a tremendous amount about your location data. I remember I have a friend who, um, at our church is retired now, but he worked, he was an army helicopter pilot and worked for Lockheed. And I think worked on a lot of classified projects. Anyway, when bin Laden <laughs> was killed by United States military forces, um, and maybe this is not, you know, a secret at the time, I kind of was like, Oh, wow. I was all about cell phones, you know, evidently um, folks, you know, close to bin Laden slipped up, you know, used a cell phone U.S. security services were able to not only intercept um, the messages, but then triangulate on the location where those originated, and that's how they found his his hideout in his compound in Pakistan, and eventually sent the SEAL team in to kill him and his family. Uh, anyway, it's you know that's an extreme example, and I'm sure there's you know plenty of people that are that are happy in the United States that, that went off the way that it did, but it was. It, it, it should get our attention that it's that big of a deal in terms of cell phone, uh, right. cell phone interception. And so anyway, I think there's probably, you know, even more conversations and issues to have around that. Um, we are just kind of using our cell phones today, but what, what are, what are we allowing our internet service providers to do? You know, the law is now allowing them to look at our, at our, uh, our packets and then sell things to advertisers that I don't yep. think should, should be happening. And I think that we, again, net neutrality, this idea of the, the sacredness, the sanctity of the end to end design of the, of the network. And, you know, I've had plenty of AT&T and other people discuss, argue with me about how critical it is, you know, for managing the network that they don't treat all packets the same, that they can do packet prioritization and that kind of thing. Um, but I think packet prioritization and making sure the network is not overwhelmed is different than what the first article was talking about in terms of, of filtering content and trying to stop content at the ISP level or at the national level. And it's also different than, you know, um, I don't know, this conversation about uh, who, who's going to be allowed to get, to get that data. Um, and are we going to, to what degree can you opt out of letting people have that data? And are there going to be new schemes for cellular data? I know that in some places, I want to say it's in Boston with mesh, you know, there, there are initiatives out there for community Wi-Fi where you have these mesh access points and you're able right. to have broad reaching Wi-Fi that, that is not based on cell towers and, so it would be interesting to have a law enforcement official who is actually, what are those called? Stingrays that are the devices that go out into the community. It broadcasts like a cell tower. So you look, they, they look like they're AT&T or Verizon. You connect to them. But what you don't know is they're sucking all of your data in. And so when they find somebody that they are interested in getting, they'll put one of these into the neighborhood. And then they will, in many cases, be able to triangulate, you know, pretty precisely on where someone is, and they'll be able to capture all of that data. It's interesting that law enforcement is, in some cases, keeping the purchase of these stingrays secret. I think we've had that in the show notes. If you do a search on our edtechsr.com for the word stingray, you'll probably find some shows where we've got a, a link to those. But again, it's uh, really important that law enforcement has the tools to be able to catch uh, folks who are uh, making bad choices and doing uh, illicit things. On the other hand, it's really important in the United States that we have processes and procedures to try to protect civil liberties um, and to involve judges and warrants and probable cause and all those things that go back to the origins of our Constitution and our Bill of Rights, which right. were not put there, you know, with light, lighthearted thinking, but with, you know, very serious thought about the ways in which we need to limit right. the forces of government. 
Right. And, you know, let's not forget that it, uh, the, the person I usually think about in this context is Thomas Jefferson, right? Thomas Jefferson, who was all about information access and collections of books. Like I keep thinking, let's let's bring that guy into 2018 and seven in front of a, a Google search engine and it would blow his mind, right? But those tools do, or, I'm sorry, the, the, those rights and the ones that were enumerated so carefully, particularly in the Bill of Rights, were, uh, you know, something that, that it can still apply today. We just have to have conversations about making sure we're all comfortable about the way those things play out, so. Absolutely. All right. Okay. Wow. We have uh, we've talked about one topic and we're halfway done with the show. So that well, may be a record. <laughs> to be clear, can of worms, right? Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, uh, I like to move next to I. You know, I, I think we might get sucked in if we start talking about the the White House's fight with Silicon Valley. So let's do some just straight nerd stuff from here for a little while. Uh, uh, some Chrome and Google news. Uh, first and foremost, big deal because this impacts me personally. But uh, the 2013. Chromebook Pixel, which was the first high-end Chromebook released by Google, has reached end of life. And end of life was actually a few months ago. It was advertised as earlier this year. And this week, there was notifications that popped up on the Chromebook Pixels uh, or by Chromebook Pixel users that it had reached end of life. That doesn't mean that laptop doesn't work anymore. It's not like a real end of life in that the laptop shuts down to receive no further updates from Google. Uh, now I have to say, I did not buy a Chromebook Pixel in 2013 because they were way too expensive uh, for what you received back then. But I did end up buying a used one a couple years later uh, for dirt cheap. It was next to nothing to purchase that particular device. And although the battery life isn't super great, it's, it's at the high end, four hours, um, it is an i5 chip, a fourth generation i5 chip that with four gigs of RAM and a beautiful touch screen and a beautiful keyboard. And I always kind of thought in the back of my head that Google would save it, that it would continue to provide updates for a while. And earlier this year, when the stated end of life didn't seem to impact my, my receiving of updates, I thought maybe I was clear there. But this Chromebook has now kind of floated down the road. And the reason why I want to talk about this for just a moment is that I, I am very interested in the kind of end of life conversation as it relates to, to laptops and desktops because schools tend to uh, hold on to hardware way longer than almost all other large purchasers of tech. Uh, the only other um, industry that I know of that hangs on to tech longer is the banking industry. And that's because they are notoriously uh, cost efficient when it comes to things like technological developments. In fact, uh, I read an article a couple of months ago that uh, there were a, a prominent series of, of, of regional banks in the Northeast were still using dummy terminals uh, that uh, were, were 40 years old, plus Plugging into a uh, a system that they had to keep, you know, uh, uh, continually developing new hardware connections for, so plugged into modern servers because they need to be able to, you know, meet the challenge of Y two K here in two thousand eighteen, right? Um, so uh, uh, this notion that Chromebooks disappear after five years and stop receiving updates probably makes sense for the low-end Chromebooks, right? The slow ARM chips, the slow Pentium chips, the slow Celeron chips. But for the i5 chip that's sitting in that 2013 Pixel, um, it's still plenty fast. It's a great laptop, and I'm just surprised that Google didn't uh, save this. So uh, so to start with, uh, and, and by the way, I have other high-end Chromebooks, so, you know, don't cry for me, Argentina, right? I clearly will be doing okay with the remaining 75 computers that I own. But, you know, let's be honest here, like that, it's it seems like a very interesting thing on Google's part to take what was originally a $1,500 laptop and have it last just five years. I think it really sucks. You know, it's, it, it's, it's basically manufacturers really reaching out through time and telling you what you can and you can't do with the device. Uh, it reminds me a little bit, you know, with uh, jailbreaking and, and iPhones and this idea like Steve Wozniak, like you own it. So shouldn't you be able to hack it? Shouldn't you be able to, you know, use it the way that you want to use it? Um, you know, there's even with printers and DRM, you know, how they tried to make it illegal to have third party printer cartridges that you have to purchase their printer cartridges. And I, I think it's different because there's software involved. But why should you not be able to 
continue to upgrade. And then if it's so slow and sluggish that it doesn't right. work, then you can decide to discard it. But for them to arbitrarily say, hey, at five years, you're not going to get any more updates. I mean, I get that there needs to be an end of life at some point, And maybe right. that's it because, you know, Microsoft with Windows XP, I mean, if you know people running it, you know, tell them not to. They need to to move move ahead. Um, you know, we just had elections yesterday here, and I'm pretty sure that some of our voting machines and and computers that are involved. I know with the blood drive that we had, that's you know, there were. I was like, wow, look at that tough book. Oh my gosh, it's Windows XP. Um, you know, those systems are still around, and I understand that companies don't have unlimited resources to be able to let's say put you know updates out for windows xp i get that because you had a you had a team that was doing it but you've got a team who's putting out the updates for the chrome os and at, at some point i get that it, that it, new hardware can't support it right like this happens with ipads this happens with iphones you know ios such and such only supports a certain you know level and then you're just right. you're, you're not going to run beyond that I, I can understand that you've got to have certain hard, you know, hardware that has enough horses. But to me, with uh, with Google Chrome, um, this this seems really really odd. And I think um, as a consumer and as a as a school, you know, technology director, uh, I mean, I, I see it as a huge issue because we probably will try to continue to use those, you know, beyond just five years. And if I can't do that safely, you know, because of security and because right. of updates, you know, am I going to be able to somehow jail, pardon me, jailbreak hack the Chromebook and, and then somehow extend the life? I mean, it just, it, it seems like, uh, it seems like a crummy thing for Google to do, but right. I probably well, articulate that. And, and to be sure, so to add it to a couple of things uh, to this particular news story, uh, the first one is that, Newer models are being supported for six and a half years. So to be fair, the uh, Chromebook Pixel 2015, the 2017 Pixel Book, these are both items that are now supported for uh, six and a half years, right? And I did end up buying a Pixel Book uh, 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 earlier this year, which uh, I end up getting on a super duper, extra super duper discount uh, at Best Buy. And I have to say, I absolutely love it. It's the nicest piece of hardware I've ever owned. I can't imagine using it six and a half years from now, right? Like I'm going to use it. I've, I've told, I've talked myself into, if you're going to buy this thing, uh, uh, Jason, you, you gotta now refer to myself in the third person, which means things are going to go way off the rails now, right? But like, you, you got to use this thing, right? It's got to be your daily driver. You can't just have a fancy toy that, that you're going to drop this money onto. I think that there is something that, uh, I think there's something to that notion that six and a half years is maybe too long, but five is too short when you have, you know, advanced hardware, right? Like when you have a, a really well-built laptop. And one of the things that Apple's very famous for is that, you know, the, the hardware build of, of almost all their stuff is pretty amazing, but they're okay with uh, and expect Apple users to sometimes use uh, 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 their hardware for three, five, six, seven years. And in some cases, use it for five years and still get an enormous amount of value out of it if you just sell that used to someone else and then buy an updated model. And so I, I, I have really mixed feelings about this, right? Like probably the five and six year old, uh, you know, slow, low end, two gigabyte RAM Chromebooks aren't super great um, and probably are terrible after five or six years. But I gotta say, when we have in the office, we're testing, we have a, a, a an Acer C, uh, C720, which is kind of the, the most infamous first uh, uh, mass-produced model by Acer on Chromebooks. We bought the one with an i3 chip in it because we knew it'd be a little faster and it's still pretty fast even today. I was using it this morning uh, uh, to test out something based on a student report and it was it was it, it's it's a five year old uh, a Chromebook and it's it's delightfully speedy right it's got a great battery life on it it's a really quality piece of hardware so um, yeah I, I I was disappointed to read that and you know I think it's going to put schools in binds at some point so I'll throw out two Android Google related articles under the same heading um, this is really an interesting one from Ars Technica on August twenty seventh Android vulnerability leads to Google and Epic Games spat. So probably the, the, the game Fortnite is something that everybody has heard of. I have actually not played that yet. Um, I think we may have one of our first digital citizenship parent meetings uh, with students around Fortnite uh, talking about it, you know, 
you know what what we see is it's it's pros and cons um and one of them frankly is that if you're going to install it on android you have to root your device and basically circumvent the the google play store which relative to apple the google play store is plagued with a lot more issues even when you're in the play store as far as vulnerabilities but definitely when you choose to um, root your device and in, and install things that aren't even approved in the store, right? You really open yourself up to a potential to to get malware and get some bad stuff on your on your system. So, Epic Games does not want to give, um, un, I guess, understandably, Google thirty percent of its income, and so it is assuming that a lot of people are going to love Fortnite enough that they're going to uh, circumvent the the protections that are in place in the Android operating system, and they're going to be able uh, installing it. So that's an interesting spat that's going on. And then another Android related article, this is from the verge on August 27th, uh, Google pixel three will be announced in October, uh, October 9th in New York city. And I think there's been some unprecedented leaks about the pixel. Somehow a lot of pixels evidently appeared in Russia. There've been breakdown videos, um, that people have shown of the pixel three, um, and so, you know, they're asking why is it, I guess, actually, okay, it was the Ukrainian black market and they're appearing there for $2,000 a piece. And anyway, their, uh, Apple, you know, has difficulty keeping the lid on, on secrets and clearly Google has as well. So any, um, uh, thoughts on this, Jason, are you ready to get the, the Google pixel three and have you rooted your said devices already so that you can spend all of that free time that you have on Fortnite instead of preparing <laughs> articles for EdTech SR. Well, I stay away from addicting substances, Dr. Fryer, so I will not be uh, attempting the Fortnite. But I want to give you a, a, a bit of a little Android perspective there. It's actually, you don't even have to root your device to install third-party uh, software. You just have to go in and enable non-Play Store, what they're called APKs. That's the downloadable uh, a package that you can get. And this is really interesting because one of the things that when this information about Epic Games releasing Fortnite direct to consumers via their website, one of the things that, that uh, some tech commentators talked about was that it was teaching a whole generation of kids how to install third-party apps, right? And that's been available in Google, in Android since the beginning, right? There are alternative app stores. Amazon has an alternative app store uh, that if you don't buy an Amazon uh, uh, modified phone, then you can just download the app store. It requires that you go in and turn off the security protections to protect, to protect, protect you from third-party software installs. Uh, there's a, a great uh, open source Android store that has only open source software software. And uh, uh, four or five years ago, when there was a lot of really crappy Android tablets running around, this is in the uh, Android 2.3 days where you could go and buy a, a $60 tablet um, that it was not even uh, in the realm of nice in comparison to, you know, now you can buy. In fact, a, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I had an old uh, a Fire tablet, which is Android based. Uh, and uh, there was a special deal for American Express customers where I was able to get their $100 eight inch tablet for $29. And so I did because I wanted the updated tablet. And it's it's a great device for, for 30 bucks, right? But, but, but uh, six years ago when you're buying $60, Android tablets and, and in my old blog before I, I moved my stuff over to NCCE I actually did a extended review of a really crappy Android uh, uh, tablet that I bought there was no Play Store on it and you had to go with third-party app stores because that was your only shot to download software so yeah I, it's interesting because um, you know, the bottom line is, is that we're teaching people how to turn off the security on their phone to install this game. And that's fine if you are otherwise savvy consumer, but I think about all the opportunities that, you know, like bad advertising does, the weird uh, uh, pop-up ads that say you have a security problem or detected a security issue, click here to download a cleaner, da 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 It'd be really easy to get, you know, some kind of terrible software on your phone doing that. So I think it's an important uh, thing to be, to, to note. And, you know, uh, most schools don't have the capacity to have every teacher, you know, teach kind of nerdy digital citizenship lessons. But even if you don't have every teacher that's aware of these pieces, these are good articles to share with your students, right? Like you may not know what the heck Fortnite is, but you know it's popular and saying just be careful out there uh, folks because I think there are risks there that you're opening yourself up for as part of that process. Absolutely. 
Um, we probably ought to scan over a, qu a few other articles quickly because we're rapidly running out of time. Um, I am and, and did this weekend participate in this uh, free podcasting class that the Knight mm -hmm. Foundation is offering and had some great articles in it. And uh, it runs five weeks. And anyway, that was my Geek of the Week, I think, last week, one of them. A uh, couple articles that were shared there. This is great from the New York Times on July 26th. Ads for podcasts test the line between story and sponsor. And it talks especially about public right. radio and how public radio, you know, folks usually walk a really careful line between, you know, endorsements and reporting. And so, you know, podcasts being unregulated by the FCC and hopefully I think we'll you know, continue to be so, but I, I really think we're on the the cusp of some massive expansion of the of the world of podcasting. I think that smart assistants are are playing a role there in terms of discovery. Um, but that's that's interesting. We have not, as those of you that have been with us on the show, know that we've you know taken that jump into sponsorship. You're not hearing any ads, um, but I honestly think it will be good for us to 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 jump into that arena to learn you know, some things about that and Hey, wouldn't it, you know, be nice to at least pay our hosting costs, um, right. you know, and, and, you know, have, have some income, but anyway, good article there. And then the other one um, was from the New Yorker on March 15th about today explained an edgy new Vox podcast to compete with the daily. And I do love the daily. Um, Caitlin um, is the person who uh, I should get her name to be able to give her um, an adequate shout out. Um, uh, let's see. I've got Caitlin Thompson. Caitlin underscore Tomps is her Twitter handle. Um, she was the presenter for week one of the podcasting course. And it really does show a little bit how their slant is a bit more mainstream media. And they're looking at things that are going to go massive. And, you know, we're definitely a long tail podcast with a, you know, a narrow following, but really specific interests. And so anyway, uh, interesting to, you know, see how podcasting has had this renaissance, how measurement has been a really important part of that as far as being able to measure the audience because you're not going to be able to get sponsorships or, or, you know, sell advertising if you can't demonstrate with some metrics, you know, your reach. And, um, you know, I think I, I'm not a listener of Today Explained. I have I have listened to some, some Vox podcasts. But anyway, another article that I would commend to you, especially – if you're interested in podcasting and especially if you are, are interested in, you know, really practical skills as well as tools and resources that you can use to create your podcast, but then also potentially market it and even monetize it. So Jason, Absolutely. are you ready to resign and just go full in for EdTech SR and say, <laughs> we're going to pay all the bills right here, baby on Wednesday night. It's going to, it's going to bring in everything we need. I'm guessing you and I could go 24 seven West and probably not bring in close to what we would need to even pay for the hosting fees for now. But I, I think that, that it, I love the fact that this channel is available. Right. And, and I have to say, I mean, I, I, other than I, my strange, a uh, quiet addiction to the West wing, which I just keep watching, you know, over and over and over and over again, all seven seasons. Uh, it's my way of escaping the, the politics news. Um, but it's, it's, you know, mostly what I listen to and I've got, a wide variety of interesting podcasts. Uh, I should mention that I think I maybe mentioned this earlier. My favorite podcast right now is By the Book. Uh, it's a panana uh, uh, plea, which I can barely pronounce. So we I, we can't have them host our podcast, Wes, because I can't pronounce it. Panana plea podcast called By the Book, which is uh, two. I think they're both former WNYC producers. Uh, they they do a different self help book every 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 month and they live by it for two weeks and they report back to it and it's extremely compelling radio right like it's super interesting even when the book wouldn't be within 500 miles of anything i'd be interested in in exploring but i think that's the kind of stuff right like what is the other avenue for that right it's it kind of public radio but not i love it because this, it's a renaissance of radio, you know, yes. and we hear the stories of, of, you know, when radios came into America and World War II and we gathered around or the families gathered around the radio. Um, and I know that there was generations that were raised on radio. My mom was telling me stories about, you know, listening to uh, different characters. Um, and, you know, I remember the shadow. I mean, that, that would have been sure. in the, the late 90s, you know. But anyway, th it is it is awesome. I mean, the empowerment, and this is the real positive side, right? We talk all kinds of negative about fake news and social media and the ways in which, you know, democracy is being subverted and, 
you know, we're, we're having um, very extremist and um, hostile voices, unfortunately, receive far more attention than uh, most of, of mainstream society would want them to, to be able to receive. But on the good side, you know, podcast really gives us some phenomenal opportunities to narrow cast and also and, right. in, in both ways, you know, in the receiving of information and ideas and then also in the sharing and publication. And I think that this podcasting course is going to inspire me to maybe do a local, you know, podcasting how to with my wife. Um, she's been having a classroom podcast now for three or four different years. And it's just, it's such a, it's such a compelling medium. And of course here we are doing video. So, but I don't, I don't think relatively speaking, a lot of folks are watching the videos. Although I learned my mom did watch last week and thought I was looking really tired, which I actually was. Um, but Anyway, a lot of people are probably, you know, consuming this via audio versus video. So Renaissance time for podcasting. Awesome to be able to, to filter. And that, I guess that's what I would say to Leo Laporte and others who are, who are either actually deleting their Twitter accounts or contemplating it is filter the freaking web, right? I mean, there's no need yeah. to subscribe to, to everyone, to follow everyone and lists. You know, I absolutely live every day consumptively on the shoulders of the Twitter list that I've built that I, that I see in Flipboard that I sometimes view in Twitter. Um, but it's, it's just a huge part of my day. And I allow right. these folks that are trusted news sources and others that are just interesting and they share stuff that I find interesting, you know, to be a, a, a huge part of, of my filtered information consumption experience. And I think that that is a 21st century skill that we should be bringing to to other teachers and to students. And it's a very interesting day with respect to mainstream media, because again, what you hear, some of these folks that are in public radio and are, you know, people that have been a, a part of large news organizations really yearning for is the breakout hit, the viral hit, the serial podcast, you know, number two, that just reaches millions. And those are going to happen some, but what is going to happen a whole lot is individuals are going to be empowered to share really niche content and information, and there are going to be fewer barriers than ever to allow people to not only share that, but then also connect with others who are doing that. And I think that is fantastic, and that's good news. Yep, absolutely. So couldn't agree with you more. Um, let's see. Unfortunately, a lot of the stuff that's remaining is also can of worms. Hey, here's a piece of good news. More female minority students took the AP computer science uh, uh, class, or I, I think I think it was the exam or class. I think it was the exam uh, in record numbers this past year. And there's a lot of increase in AP computer science. It was exam participation. All students increased by 25% last year, but female students by 39%, uh, Hispanic and Latino students by 41%, and Black and African American students uh, by 44%. And just because I feel like bragging about it, 100% uh, of MTDA's AP computer science students passed the, I'm sorry, 100% of MTDA's AP computer science test takers passed the AP exam last year. So shout out to all of you that work hard to get students prepared for those delightful exams. Absolutely. Uh, let's see. Let's do maybe one or two more, and then we better better hit the geeks of the week. Um, uh, let's talk about the Apple news for a second. Um, I was really surprised by this, uh, but you mentioned the article about how they're going to remove 3D touch from new iPhones, and this has sparked actually quite a, a, a lengthy debate on um, uh, amongst the tech media because there are some people that are very... Um, uh, big defenders of this particular uh, functionality. This is the 3D, 3D touch functionality that essentially lets you press a little harder. It's it's I, I've only been able to play with it a couple of times. So Wes, you may know uh, more about this, but it's this notion that if you press a little harder, if there's a slightly more aggressive touch, it can bring up more options on a menu. You can actually recreate it now in Android, although it's not as elegant because it doesn't have the Apple hardware. But uh, the reason why this, this particular article is interesting to me is because I remember watching the iPhone announcement that announced 3D Touch, and I thought this was the most boring thing ever. And it's part of what started pushing me a little bit away from the Apple ecosystem. And so I guess I would start with you being kind of our Apple guy on the podcast. Are you going to miss 3D Touch? 
No, I mean, I, I try to use it some, but it's definitely not something that I think most people are doing a lot with. Uh, it's very underwhelming. I, th I think it has a, it has too, too techie of a bar, you know, Apple has that yeah. simplicity of interface with, you know, going all the way back to the click wheel pod, you know, iPod, which was so amazing, just the simplicity of, of power and, and home button. And I think that it's just, there's going to be words for it, but it's basically too complex for most users. Um, we always have this with even the trackpad, you know, there's different gestures and things like that, that a lot of people probably don't, don't utilize because you're going to have to just, you know, get trained with it. So um, not really surprised to see that headline, but I wouldn't say that that was a push one way or the other, you know, from the platform for me. Right. Right. And so, uh, yeah, interesting stuff. And then the other rumor is that, uh, well, there's a lot of rumors swirling around right now. I think last week in the podcast, we reported that there's a, a supposedly new iPod or iPod, <laughs> no new iPods. The from quick Apple wheel iPods coming back. <laughs> it's coming back. New USB-C connector. Um, the Mac Air, MacBook Air is, is apparently going to get a reboot this fall. There's a lot of uh, interesting stuff, but uh, apparently uh, three new iPhones are in the uh, uh, pipeline, according to The Verge, which reported this um, yesterday. There is a... Um, uh, more colors coming. They're going to go back to that color thing that came with the plasticity iPhones from a couple years ago. Or uh, how did um, their industrial designer put it? Unapologetically plastic. So, um, and those fizzled, obviously. And then um, one of the things that is also weird because last year when they released the iPhone 8, they also really released the iPhone X slash 10. And uh, there's apparently been a lot of discussion about how uh, how to name these new phones. They really can't be nines since, you know, 10s or Xs exist. And so they're talking about X X XS, which is a terrible name. Um, and the iPhone XS Plus, which is a huge mouthful. Like, I just keep thinking Steve Jobs uh, would, would, would not approve of these names. Yep. Real fast, a couple of social media articles, because I want you to, to just at least briefly talk about Motherboard. Um, Washington Post, August 21st, Facebook is rating the trustworthiness of its users on a scale from zero to one. There was an interview with uh, somebody who's dealing with fake news for Facebook, and this came out that, of course, they're trying to have algorithms that can help with this. And so they are trying to figure out you know, how trustworthy the links are that folks are sharing and then make decisions in the news feed about whether to promote or demote uh, whether to emphasize those uh, people who are sharing things. Um, the one I'd like you to comment on, Jason, is from Motherboard, August 23rd. The impossible job inside Facebook struggle to moderate 2 billion people. So this is a great article. And I, of, of, uh, we don't always have articles that I think are must read. This one is a must read. And it's long and, and very detailed. And um, uh, it is. It seems like it should be easy to say, great, Facebook, stop spreading fake news. But the sheer amount of content shared on the platform means that almost all solutions come with other unintended consequences. And so what this article does an excellent job of is talk about that, you know, there's a lot of, well, like a, a few years ago when they got in real trouble because they were starting to hand or human generate uh, top news that appeared on the right hand side of your desktop feed uh, on Facebook, got them in trouble because it tended to have a left wing bias to it. And then for a little while it swung right, which of course uh, annoyed the other side of the political spectrum. This article does a really good job of talking about why it's not just as simple as turning on a content moderation engine and doing something with that. And uh, I strongly recommend, especially if you thought to yourself, man, why is this not easier or why are, is there not more uh, effort put into uh, you know, how to make this work out? Uh, that article will go into detail about that. And I believe this was also featured on this week's uh, uh, This Week in Tech podcast on Sunday, the uh, uh, Twit Network's uh, flagship podcast. I only heard a little bit of it and then click on the link later to read the article. Read the article. It's really good and gives you some detail about the challenge of that. Um, one of the things I would also like to highlight, it reminded me of another uh, 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 
another story that uh, uh, this was the case a couple of years ago, but YouTube has always um, uh, been really challenged by how to take down inappropriate information. It's not the copyright stuff because they've got a pretty good engines for that, but the things that are truly like the violate your know, most sense of community standards. And so they have people that go and moderate um, uh, 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 pieces of that, and what's you know what's interesting about that is that that's a very dangerous job, right? You can have logarithms that kick up things to you that are likely to be suspect, and you can have human uh, uh, moderators in the form of your users kick up things that are, are suspect. But to actually go through and watch those things, those are the worst jobs on earth, right? People that click through thousands of photos a day to look for you know truly terrifying. Um, uh, violent uh, 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 photos, like it, it, it is demeaning to the brain, right? It's a, it causes extraordinary amounts of stress. But yeah, read that article uh, because it just gives you a sense of how complicated it is um, uh, to try to, you know, do all of that in, in even in 2018. All right. Well, this is a, this is an evening where I feel like we could uh, we could go another hour, but I don't think <laughs> we're going to do that. So we probably better uh, geek of the week. It. I will go first. Violating. The, the rule of one geek of the week with three uh, stickbot studio app for iOS. My wife is about to start a after school club for stop motion. And this is the app that they're looking to use. We've done things with coma coma, which is a nice free app for iOS and also the Lego app, but the Lego app is not available anymore, but stickbot studio is free and supports green screen and looks like a great app. Next Google assistant. Uh, hey, G, tell me something good. It's a new feature they're rolling out so that if you'd like to escape the dystopian reality of mainstream news, you can ask Google to lighten your day with something good to listen to. And then lastly, YouTube is rolling out new screen time management tools. So we're all going to be able to, if we want, find out from YouTube how long we're spending, get some uh, notices to say, hey, why don't you you know, not watch this and why don't you you know, get up and walk around. Uh, and I think that is, again, an interesting commentary, partly part of the, quote, correction that Jason talks about often in the show as far as tech companies and how they're responding and, you know, interestingly seeming in this case to respond against their own self-interest because YouTube really wants us to watch as much as possible because then they're going to watch, we're going to see more ads, and they're going to make more money. But they're recognizing the backlash that's happening in society. And part of that backlash right. is that we recognize the addictive nature of these things and how if we're going to be healthy, we don't want to be looking at a screen, you know, more than X hours of the day. And so you can decide what that limit is. I've not done that yet, but I definitely will be sharing that with our parents and students. Again, not to say, you know, this is all the, you know, YouTube you should watch, but to say, hey, limits, boundaries, uh, intentionality with the use of digital media, these are all important things for us to try and do. Um, and I want to highlight a quick one, and uh, this is a, a little tech tip, but the thing that uh, I find to be really interesting is that most of the power users I know of, of most software platforms have figured out that keyboard shortcuts are a really important way to be speedy in utilizing an application. And what I just discovered a, a couple of months ago that's actually made preparing for this show a lot easier is control K in Google Docs to add a hyperlink. And what the, the thing that's interesting to me is if I put the article title, like I copy and paste the article title into Google Docs and then highlight and press control K, Google does a good job of trying to guess which link I'm, I'm going for. And it's right about 95% of the time. Um, it also works if you type, like, for example, my, my, my day job is the Montana Digital Academy. If you uh, type that out and, and highlight that and press control K to hyperlink that, it's going to pop up my main website uh, and, and do some interesting pieces of work for you. So uh, first, you know, figure out text short or keyboard shortcuts is awesome. Um, and that's one I stumbled into that's actually been a great time saver. And I'm actually honestly surprised that this is the first time I thought of mentioning it here. And for Mac users out there, it'll be Command K. So yes, yeah. thank you, kind yeah. sir, to and interpret that for and the creative works. world. So. I just tried it. So this has been the EdTech Situation Room, your 105th episode. We are here generally at 9 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Mountain, and we thank Peggy George for joining us in our chat room. We would encourage anyone who listens to the show, if you can, to try and join us at 3 a.m. UTC, which is, I guess, the time in Britain that we are live on the web. But you can find me at uh, speedofcreativity.org. I think I will hopefully 
uh, maybe even tomorrow night, be publishing a new podcast. Maybe it'll be a weekend podcast, but haven't, haven't shared something in a while. And anyway, it's, uh, yeah, it's crazy at work because I have been the one, the one legged man at the three legged race, um, because my assistant tech director had his last day a couple of weeks ago. So anyway, yeah, going to get some more stuff published W Fryer on Twitter, Jason, where can people continue to learn the goodness that you have to share between Wednesday night episodes on EdTech SR. Well, um, I'm on Twitter at Tech Savvy Teach. I will not be deleting my Twitter account because it's been a very useful way to connect with people across the United States and around the world in regards to technology, particularly in the classroom. I'm also the Tech Savvy Administrator in Residence for the Northwest Council for Computer Education. Lots of exciting things going on at NCCE. You can follow our work at ncc.org or blog.ncc.org. And I'm the assistant director of the Montana Digital Academy. You can learn more about our organization at montanadigitalacademy.org. Uh, this action here, though, is not just us. It's the EdTech Situation Room. We're here on Wednesday nights. Uh, we love it if you come live. Peggy George, our, our biggest uh, chat room fan, is always there talking back and forth with Wes and I. We'd love to see you there. Uh, if you would like to listen to this not live. We have it available on our website at techsr.com. We can do, download tiny, teeny little versions of it, or we are on every podcast directory now that I see. Uh, we can you can find it at Tech SR. So look for us there. And you can simply tell your Google Assistant, and I'm gonna guess our Echo. You've tried this on Echo as I well. Have. Hey G, play the latest episode of the EdTech Situation Room, and you will hear us. That is a very cool thing, and it's a harbinger. There's my word of the show uh, of the future, which is going to be more digital assistants, more AI in our lives, and being able to use our voices to control and things and cast magical spells. We're all Harry Potter and Hermione Granger now. So until next time. Stay safe and be savvy, and we'll see you next week. Good night.